Hi everyone. So it's been about six months since my last video on this channel. And I know some of you have been wondering uh, what happened, uh, where did I go? I, I appreciate all the messages. I'm still here. I didn't disappear. I didn't fall off the planet. Uh, I didn't plan to be gone for so long, but um, it extended a little bit longer than expected. I'll explain a little bit more on that at the end of this video. But since this is the first video back, I thought it might be interesting to look at some kind of eye-catching or interesting Amish news stories that have been occurring recently over the past few months. So let's dive into it. First story I wanted to share with you uh, has to do with a very, um, for me, interesting topic, and that's the Amish population. As you probably know, it's constantly growing. Amish people have large families. You know, they have six, eight, ten children in a family is not uncommon. And also most of their children tend to choose baptism in the Amish church. And so those two factors combined means they have a very high growth rate. So the Young Center at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania every year puts out a population estimate for the Amish in North America. And it usually comes out like late summer. So the, the latest numbers I can share with you, some of you may have an idea of how many Amish there are in existence today. We're up to an estimated 383,565 Amish people. If you compare that to the figure from five years ago, the Amish population has increased by over 50,000 people since then. So nothing's really changed there. Uh, but there are also, also often some interesting details in these reports when they come out, and I was going to share a couple of them with you. Now, the total of the total population, the bulk of that is in the U.S. 377,000 Amish uh, live in the U.S. You have about 6,000 in Canada. And there's a small uh, portion of the Amish living in South America. A little bit under 200 Amish live there. One of the interesting things on that last bit is that there were previously Amish in two countries in South America, in Bolivia and in Argentina. And since, uh, since basically since last year, the Argentina community has disbanded. Some of them have moved to Bolivia, um, some to the U.S., some have gone in other directions. Another little point here is that uh, back in March, those of you who read the Amish America website and the blog, I, I posted about news that, or the suggestion that the Amish in South Dakota, in their one community there, were going to be leaving the state. And we actually came across uh, several Amish homes that had gone up for sale uh, on, on sites like Zillow. And by the way, if you haven't seen it, you can often find uh, Amish-owned homes for sale uh, on you know internet real estate listing sites like Zillow, like Realtor.com, and so forth, uh, and I often post about those on the website. But uh, it's a way for Amish to sell their properties uh, to a wider market than just their local Amish community, because in some of these cases, you've just got maybe four, five, six, eight, ten families there, and there are not a lot of potential Amish buyers. Okay, if you want to move to a different area, so you need to open that up more to the English or non-Amish market. Okay. So anyway, so there was a, there was a news report. I actually spoke to a reporter from a local South Dakota paper at the time, um, that the community was going to be on the way out. It sounds like they're not quite gone yet, but the other kind of news, I guess, would be that a second South Dakota community has been added to the list. And so for me, I'm happy about that because I like seeing, you know, the number of States that have Amish, even if it's just one community, uh, I like to see them growing, right? So there's still 32 states that have an Amish presence. On that point, we haven't added any new states to the uh, to the list since last year. Uh, last year, we did have New Mexico join the list, a small community, uh, and I did a video on uh, that settlement. And finally, we've got close to 3,000 Amish church districts now. And what's a church district? Well, the church district is how the Amish organize their churches, and they're basically uh, 25 to 35 families typically living in one geographical area, and they have to live close to each other because when they meet up for their church services, they, you know, they're typically coming on foot or by buggy um, or scooter or however, and, uh, you know, they can't be too far apart, obviously. So, uh, and why 25 to 35 families? Well, the Amish, most Amish uh, do have a church in the home, or, you know, the home, not literally always in the home, sometimes in the basement or in a workshop or another structure on the property. Uh, but the point being that Amish uh, do something like what you would call home worship. They use the structures that are already available to them rather than building 
a separate church or meeting house. Now, there are some Amish who build meeting houses, but that's quite rare, and that's maybe another topic. So basically, you know, you've got, you know, close to 3,000 individual Amish church districts now, and each church district has its own ordnung, uh, which, are, which are the rules or the guidelines or the regulations governing daily Amish life. Things like technology, uh, style of clothing, those are mutually agreed upon and reviewed twice yearly. So you can have a whole variety of different uh, Amish practices and across this, you know, nearly 400,000 Amish and nearly 3,000 Amish churches, you've got everything from the very conservative Amish using low technology, as you've probably seen in a lot of the videos, I like the Schwarzenegger Amish on, on that end, and you've got, you know, all the way to the more progressive Amish who will permit more, will, some, some of whom may have smartphones to help operate their businesses and are more progressive in other ways, but they're still under the same Amish umbrella. So, so just wrapping it all together, you know, the Amish continue to grow and there continue to be different ways of being Amish. And I think that's really cool. <laughs> so on to the next story, and uh, I hope you like this format. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about later and why I stopped doing videos so regularly has a little bit to do with the format of my videos because I was finding it really challenging to produce the types of videos I was making before where it was just my voice and every second of the video was, uh, you know, a visual, a, you know, a photograph that represented the community I was talking about uh, or, you know, a snippet of video. And so that's actually one factor that prevented me from putting out videos as I would like to and um, kind of got a little burned out on it. So I'm trying this format out. You'll see there have been some images in this video. And uh, I hope you don't mind me talking to you more and seeing more of me on the camera, uh, a little less of the Amish, but hopefully this way I'll be able to do more uh, videos. So the next story I want to get to is is a tragic one in some ways, and also one that had a bit of a bizarre twist that still hasn't been explained yet. And um, this uh, is about a buggy accident. And you've, you know, if you keep up with Amish in the news, you see many buggy accidents happening, you know, on a, seemingly on a weekly or multiple times a week basis, oftentimes fatal accidents. And sadly, there was another one of those in, uh, in late September this year uh, in Fillmore County, Minnesota. Four Amish children were buggying uh, to, I believe, to school in the morning. Uh, it was a Monday morning, and they were actually rear-ended around like eight or so in the morning. And two of the girls in the two sisters in the in the buggy uh, were killed: Irma Miller, age eleven, and Wilma, age seven. Two other children, their uh, their siblings were injured, uh, but survived. This is uh, in a lot of ways not unlike other accidents that have happened. Uh, you often have, you know, rear end accidents happening. Sometimes there's glare from the sun. Sometimes there's low visibility if it's dusk or if there's mist and fog. Some buggies are not very well lit. Okay, I'm not sure that that was the case in this one. I believe this is a little bit more progressive uh, group where this happened. What made this story kind of bizarre is that shortly after the accident happened, there emerged questions about who was actually driving the vehicle. Now, originally it was said to be a 35 year old uh, woman by the name of Sarah Peterson. But what emerged is that the actual driver may have in fact been her twin sister, Samantha. Uh, she has an identical twin sister. And so there's been an investigation into this, who was actually driving uh, the theory. And apparently there's been a statement that from from uh, the one who was in fact driving that, she was you know, impaired, high on drugs at the time. It was apparently a phone call made by her to, to an associate or a friend uh, where she said that. The idea there would have been that the twin sister, other twin that wasn't driving, who was you know, you know, assumedly not on drugs at the time, she appeared at the scene shortly after the accident and um, took responsibility uh, for the accident as her sister, pretending to be her sister. Strange story. Um, this is apparently something, according to the report in the Minnesota Star Tribune, that the twins here have done before. So um, you've got questions there, not only of you know how did the accident happen, but who was responsible for it, and uh, that's apparently still under investigation at this time. The latest piece of this story is that the father of the girls agreed to do an interview with the local uh, news station KTTC 
where a, re a reporter came and visited with the family and uh, Menno, uh, Menno Miller, the father, spoke uh, on camera. Now he didn't appear, you know, where you can see his face, but you can see his hands. And that's something that Amish will agree to do sometimes if they, you know, want to do an interview. They, they you might have a shot from the, taken from the back of the head or just, you know, not showing their, their, their upper body. But in any case, Menno talked about how the uh, family was dealing with the loss, how the community has responded. Um, the couple, Menno's wife, is named Sarah. They have six surviving children. Uh, the two that were also in the accident are, they say, are physically okay. Uh, at least one is returned to school. Um, but uh, of course, uh, there's, there's trauma there, uh, no doubt. And Menno said in the video that there's a lot of tears. I was told tears are healing, and I believe that's true. When you hear... Uh, uh, Amish speak about these types of accidents. Uh, you you know you you kind of get a window into their perspective uh, on on this world and on the next world. And uh, what I mean by that is, um, you know, we all we've many of us have heard about how Amish are known for their forgiveness. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that it's automatic or easy for them, and they still feel the pain of loss. I mean, if you lose two daughters, it doesn't matter what culture you're from. I mean, that's a painful. I can't even imagine experience to go through. So Minnow was uh, talking about this and he said, you know, at one point in the interview, he said, well, when there are times here, there are times here. The idea of the Amish hold there is that when God decides it's your time, it's your time. So, the, you know, so those beliefs help with acceptance when these tragedies happen. Uh, and, you know, it's sometimes hard for non-Amish people to kind of... Um, I don't know, wrap their head around that or accept that. Uh, the Amish tend to be accepting about it, but it's just not, it doesn't mean that they don't feel pain uh, or have struggles with forgiveness, you know? Uh, and Minnow interestingly talks about that in the interview here as well. He was asked about it and he said that, you know, do we blame somebody? And he said, yes and no. I mean, we struggle with that. And he said that it would be nice to get an apology. He said, we're not gonna press charges, uh, it, but it would make it a little easier if they showed a little remorse. But at this point, they're trying to keep their stuff covered up, the two gals. And they actually tried to reach out to um, one, of the, one of the sisters, I guess the one that was allegedly driving. And he said that my father-in-law tried to contact Sarah Peterson, but we couldn't get through. Basically we, what we were gonna tell them is, hey, feel free to come out to the wake, the funeral, whatever. Uh, let's just visit. But yeah, we couldn't get through. So that didn't work out. So, I mean, I don't want to speculate too much, but I imagine if, <laughs> if it's true that one is covering up for the other, uh, you know, the fact that the one was driving, then, you know, it, it would be hard to, uh, you know, calm with remorse uh, in that sort of a situation that really complicates things. That legal side of that is still, uh, I think, going to play out here, but very tragic. I've got a link to where you can watch the, the full video interview with Menno uh, in the description here. So the third story I want to share with you on a bit brighter note is uh, about uh, an interesting bank. And why would I be talking to you about a bank? Well, this is a bank called the Bank of Burden Hands, uh, which was founded in Lancaster County in the area of Burden Hands. Some of you might know that's one of the main kind of tourist towns in the middle of that Amish community. It was founded in 2013, way back uh, 10 years ago. Uh, with a lot of Amish involvement and Amish investors at the time. Uh, interestingly, at that time, it was the first new U.S. bank uh, in the past three years. And if you think back to that time, we had just kind of been coming out of a financial crisis in the late 2000s where, you know, a lot of banks went under, big banks. And so this story, when they decided to open this bank, got a lot of national attention, you know, this Amish bank. But the idea there is that to have a bank that really caters for the Amish community in that area. So what does that mean? Well, it, it can mean things like making it easier to get uh, mortgages for homes that don't have electrical connections. Because apparently that's an issue with a conventional bank. It can be harder to get that approval uh, when you go through the more conventional banking system. So this is a bank that's designed to make that process easier. Uh, making it easier to open a bank account without a photo ID, which is something you can understand the Amish would need, would appreciate. Probably the most interesting aspect of this bank, at least from my perspective, is that they operate several uh, mobile banking units. They're called uh, by the Amish the Gelt Bus, which is like translated money bus. And these are basically uh, mobile banks that go around to different 
locations in Lancaster County in that community and set up for a certain number of hours in a, you know, I don't know where it's maybe in a parking lot or in just some area where Amish people from the surrounding farms and homes can come up can ride their scooter up uh, to the side of the bank and, uh, it, it, you know, do their banking business. It actually has an ATM machine built into the side of the, uh, of the bus there. So that's a pretty cool, you, uh, unique, I guess. I, I, I don't, maybe other communities do that or other banks do that, but I've never heard of it before. That's a pretty cool feature that you can see why the Amish would appreciate. One other point about this story, Lancaster Online did a story on the bank and um, this on its 10th anniversary. It's been really successful. Now they started back in 2013 with something like $17 million in capital, and which is not, it sounds like a lot of money, but for a bank, not huge. But today they've grown to something like $1.2 billion in assets. You know, they really appeal to the Amish. You can see um, where that growth uh, maybe comes from, but they also are open to non-Amish customers as well. So I'm not really aware of any other banks with such direct Amish involvement, but they saw a need there in their local market. I mean, part of that was also having a bank that catered to the Amish on a kind of a person to person level to kind of know who you're uh, dealing with and, you know, have someone who understands your way of life and your culture. Uh, the previous popular bank that a lot of the Amish in the area used had actually been acquired by a larger uh, bank uh, prior to this one being open. So that event actually, uh, I think, was part of the uh, you know, inspiration or, or created part of the need to open uh, a bank that catered to the Amish community in that area, the Plain community. So the fourth story I wanted to share with you is out of Ohio, uh, specifically the Holmes and Wayne County Amish settlements. But it only really involves the Amish uh, secondarily or indirectly. And what do I mean by that? So the story is about a business which uses Amish branding for their products, who kind of got some bad PR this past week for their alleged labor practices. Now, this is a company called Gerber's, and they sell a type of chicken uh, that's branded as Amish Farm Chicken. When I first saw this, I thought maybe this is another example of a company that's using like Amish, uh, you know, loosely or, you know, using the word Amish country uh, to describe their products, but not necessarily not representing an Amish, you know, own business uh, or not having such a connection with the Amish. But in fact, this, uh, according to their website, they do sell a chicken that's raised on Amish farms in the area. The problem is that according to a story in NBC News, they were raided by federal agents uh, earlier this month, earlier in October, and the agents found over two dozen miners illegally working uh, inside the poultry plant, um, in the meat processing and sanitation parts of the plant. And the story notes that according to U.S. law that you have to be, you know, at least age 18 to work in meat processing because it's a dangerous, potentially dangerous job, potentially very dangerous. There have been, you know, many accidents, people losing their lives. According to the story, most of the uh, underage workers there were from Guatemala. This is uh, an issue that's apparently under, under investigation right now. I did a post about this and I actually talked about a couple different aspects of this story. Part of it being the marketing side of things. You can check out the post if you want more uh, on that part and some of the marketing choices made by this company. But the thing I want to focus on here is the, the aspect as it relates to the Amish. You may have seen my video uh, called, Is It Really Amish? Where you, you, know, you look at products and you see a lot of Amish being used on products. Amish this, Amish that, Amish country. Uh, you know, that, that word is quite powerful from a branding and marketing sales perspective. It has a lot of positive connotations, which is why a lot of producers of products like to use it. Um, the best, I guess, would be if they actually have Amish connections, that if the products they sell actually come from Amish people, Amish businesses, maybe even have Amish within their businesses. But they're not, they're not all that way, as you probably can guess. It's just interesting to me because from an Amish perspective, it's when they're involved in something like this. And again, for the children in this case, for the minors, we don't know how their exact age is and so forth. That's a matter that I, I assume will be resolved through the investigation. Good for their welfare that this was found out. But that aside, just from the Amish perspective, people can sell things. There's, there's not a copyright on Amish. People can sell things. I can call, you know, this my Amish computer and sell it. You know, I can, you know, make Amish coffee cups, whatever. 
doesn't mean they're from the Amish. The Amish don't really have control over their name. Uh, but it is kind of a challenge and a risk for some Amish when they are doing business uh, in some of these cases, like with this uh, Amish farm chicken. When a story like this happens, again, strictly from the business perspective, uh, it's pretty bad PR for your company when you have two dozen miners working. The thing is that when someone reads this story, they're going to see Amish farm chicken, uh, you know, business raided by federal agents and, you know, two dozen miners found. Some people are going to assume that's an Amish operation. You know, in other words, like the, the people that aren't as informed or don't know the company are going to see Amish and say, oh, the Amish are employing, illegally employing uh, underage uh, immigrant children. Okay. It's not great for the Amish either. Um, but I guess that's just something for Amish people and businesses to think about when they do have those business relationships with non-Amish companies that the Amish as the owners of that name don't fully control, uh, you know, what happens with their name, right? If someone does something and looks bad, people are going to think, oh, it has, uh, says Amish on it. It must've been the Amish, right? That did this. Not everybody, but there are people that will make that assumption. Ah, the company, I, sounds like they have good chicken. Sounds like they have a nice background story and I'm sure it's probably a, a good company. Uh, but, you know, when you have like two dozen miners, over two dozen miners working there, that's not one or two or three that just sort of fell through the cracks, right? So it looks bad, right? Uh, maybe there's an explanation for it, but it doesn't look bad for uh, either that company or again, indirectly the Amish too, since they have that association here. So check that story out on, on the website if you want more. So next story, this is a bit of a disturbing story, but I wanted to share it with you. A rather bizarre story out of Missouri. Uh, this past week, uh, a man who you can tell by his photograph has an Amish appearance and also an Amish name, allegedly confessed to seeking to kill, and I said kill, 11 Amish children in his community. Is very kind of bizarre. This was, it kind of blew my mind when I saw this, and I had a couple thoughts uh, immediately. The man he stopped at the residence of two witnesses to you know, do whatever he was going to do, but there was no one at home. He had recently actually purchased uh, a revolver and a bunch of ammunition uh, the same day. Uh, apparently, the man had never owned a gun before. It says that a sheriff's deputy managed to stop uh, Slayball. Is his last name not too far from the witness's home. So there are some clues to what's going on here if you look a little bit closer. And one of those is the detail in the story that it says Slayball allegedly attempted to destroy and damage his brother's property in the past, though no charges were filed. So there's a mention of his brother. Uh, you know, we can probably make the assumption that this may have been, may very well have been his brother's family that he was going after. Yeah, don't know for sure, but... Uh, reading between the lines, that's that's what it so sounds like. Now, you know, you think of this idea of an Amish person wanting to, ki you know, kill other Amish children in a community. It's it's beyond bizarre. The first thing I thought of was that there may be some mental health issues going on here because you know, the Amish are generally quite law-abiding, and the instances of murder among the Amish are very low. Right? It's very rare now. Has it happened before? Yeah, there have been cases of homicide done by Amish uh, men. And it's typically has been against their wives. There's several stories of that. Uh, I've got that detailed on my site. I'm not going to go too into it right here. Uh, one of those is actually the subject of a movie right now, the Eli Weaver story. So, um, you know, this, this very well could be a case of mental illness. We don't know. Uh, it is bizarre enough, so that's what you would think. When you have a story like this, it's also a, a reminder that the Amish are human as, as well. And they have, they have some problems uh, too. And, um, you know, there are mental health issues among some Amish people like there are in other communities. And that's something that some Amish have become more aware of and have taken steps to address in their communities as well. Finally, last story I wanted to share with you is not so much a news story, but I wanted to draw your attention to an interesting article about a group of Amish called the Michigan Circle Amish, uh, also known as the Michigan Amish Fellowship. This group was featured in an article in the Journal of Plain Anabaptist Communities, uh, written by Edsel Burge of uh, the Young Center at Elizabethtown College. It's an interesting look at an affiliation uh, of Amish that is distinct in some way from other 
uh, groups. And so he goes into kind of what makes them distinct, how they came about. Uh, there are certain beliefs uh, that maybe differ or practices that differ from other Amish that makes the circle of Amish uh, different, makes them interesting in some ways. They're different in that, um, and this just doesn't make them unique, but they are against tobacco use, uh, what they call impure courtship practices, uh, and, the mo and the more notorious wild rumspringa activities in some of the larger Amish settlements. So other things that make this, this affiliation a little different, they're described as reformist. When they create new communities, they do that kind of intentionally. Like when their communities get, you know, a certain size, they're going to, rather than let them get too big, they're going to start a new uh, community in a different area. Uh, which, you know, for most Amish, the communities grow and then it's kind of up to the individuals whether like the community feels too big for them and they want to go somewhere else. So they emphasize starting new communities rather than just dividing the current community into more and more church districts, uh, which we talked about at the beginning of this video. If you're still with me, so hopefully you are. <laughs> okay, we're almost, almost finished. For the Michigan Am Amish Fellowship, from Edsel's article here, true spirituality originates in the new birth an inner transformation that results in obedience to God's word. What distinguishes the Michigan Amish Fellowship from some other reformist-minded Amish is the mechanism by which they discern whether or not their members have the new birth. The Michigan Fellowship expects its members to articulate how they understand both the new birth and the ongoing experience of inner transformation. The fellowship will not baptize youth or receive members from other Amish communities unless they can do so. Okay, so that's a, that's a bit of a different perspective there, right? Furthermore, the Michigan Amish Fellowship understands a scriptural church to be one that operates as a brotherhood. Uh, as the Marian Bishop said, whatever we do, we do as a church. For example, when there is a school meeting, the expectation is that everyone will attend and not just the parents of the students. Also, discrete youth groups are downplayed. When a singing is planned, it is for the whole church, not just the youth. And so that contrasts with Many other communities where it's more about the youth, although you know parents often will come and, and, and other family members will come and, and join and observe the singing. Uh, here, this group emphasizes that it's for the whole church. And finally, the Michigan and Fellowship believes that the most important vehicle for a living witness is a well-functioning brotherhood that demonstrates to its immediate neighbors what it means to love one another. Their hope is that such a witness will attract seekers. So seekers are people that would like to join the Amish. So this is quite different from most Amish in that they're, they're kind of passively, actively, in some way they're making themselves open and um, desirous of bringing more people into their, into their church circle. And most Amish are not gonna do that. Most Amish, and I did a video on this, <laughs> three reasons why Amish don't want you to join them, uh, explaining why they're not typically looking for seekers, and there's some valid reasons there, um, this would be quite different from, from most Amish. It goes on to say, of course, as with any Amish group, uh, there are significant cultural barriers for those from non-Amish backgrounds to join an Amish church. One of the primary barriers is linguistic. The Michigan Fellowship attempts to bridge this barrier by conducting its Sunday schools in English and by providing non-Pennsylvania Dutch speakers with translators for church meetings. However, the number of members from non-plain backgrounds is very small. So they are, they're, become, they're accommodating in, in multiple ways, uh, but still it just goes to show that it's, it's difficult to become an Amish person, uh, although not unheard of. And I've got some videos on, on that topic too, talking about some people that actually did convert and become Amish and remained Amish for, for uh, in some cases, a very long time until they passed away. And, you know, this Michigan circle had originated in Michigan and um, most of the churches or a bulk of the churches are in Michigan uh, today, but uh, there are uh, now quite a few that are outside of the uh, state's borders, including in Maine, uh, the community of uh, that you may have heard of called Unity, which... Uh, talked about, I know, at least on the website a number of times, we've had a lot of posts on that, is part of the circle, Unity is. Uh, you've also got churches in, in Missouri and Kentucky, uh, in Wyoming, and several in Montana as well. There may, be, there may be more than that even today. As I said at the beginning of this video, there's many different ways of being Amish, and this just demonstrates another way uh, of, of being Amish. And, um, you know, are these Amish people more Amish? 
uh, or less Amish than other Amish? Well, that's, you know, that's not really a question I'm interested in <laughs> exploring. Maybe the Amish themselves have opinions on that. But again, they're regarded as Amish by other Amish as well that are not from their immediate group. So this is just another piece of the Amish puzzle, if you want to call it that. So everyone, thanks for hanging out for my news stories. Uh, let me know what you think of this format. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'd like to do more videos like this. Maybe not in, uh, you know, everyone being a news story format, but uh, videos where I'm going to be discussing with you on camera more. Less visuals from the Amish, but I'll try to keep adding some of those as well. It's just to give you the content, uh, it's really hard to, you know, with my uh, one person team that I currently have, it's really hard to provide you with the you know video and images for for every second of me speaking it's very time intensive uh and i love doing the videos don't get me wrong it's just uh i was a bit burning out uh on on making them and the other reason i promise you i'll tell you where i've been well the other kind of thing that dragged me away from videos is that i needed to devote more attention to the amish america website and the site uh, if you don't know i've actually been uh, doing that for know, going on about right about 17 years now. Um, I started that way back in 2006 as a simple little blog, and over the years it grew into more of a resource. And I've got you know a lot of articles on Amish in different states, uh, answers to Amish questions: Why do Amish do this? Why do they live this way? Um, a business directory, and so on. And there's you know there's well over 3,000 posts and articles on that site, and so. Over time, uh, you know, this, you know, things build up and you need to do some sort of a uh, revision and update. And that's what I've spent a lot of the last months doing is uh, updating some things. Some things you can see visually when you go on the site. I mean, there's a new design. It's still a simple design, but I think uh, easier to read, bigger text, um, larger images. Um, and, you know, and, and, and part of that is behind the scenes as well that you don't immediately see, but uh, hopefully are helping the site to perform better, uh, to be faster. Um, also, uh, I'm updating uh, not a lot of the pages with new information, new photos, uh, the latest information on the states, the communities, po communities, populations, and so forth. And it's very time consuming. I enjoy it, but it's, um, you know, until, <laughs> until I expand Amish America operations larger, which, you know, may be, may be coming, uh, I'm, I'm going to need to find a way to manage both running the site and also creating videos for you. Uh, so I hope you understand. Um, I hope I didn't offend anyone by disappearing, uh, by disappearing for longer than I expected. I did post about it once or twice on the community page, um, but I, I realized not everyone would have seen that. And, um, but thank you for your interest. Thanks to all of you that have reached out, uh, to see where I am. And uh, just letting you know, I'm, I'm back. Um, I plan to start releasing more videos. Uh, it may be at a slower pace than you're used to, but uh, I'm gradually revving that back up. And um, just happy you're here, happy that you, you know, if you wanna keep watching this channel, stay with the channel. I really appreciate that. I appreciate all your comments and sharing the channel and everything. So, uh, you know, I hope to, uh, you know, be in touch with you and interact with you and hear you in the comments and so forth and look forward to making more videos. So let me know what you think and uh, signing off for now. Talk to you next time.